<clears throat> well, so welcome everyone. My name is Tim Seltenfuss um, with Galen Driscoll. I'm facilitating uh, the Wordsmith Restoration Advisory Board meeting this evening. Thank you for uh, taking time to join us, whether in person, uh, virtually, or over the phone. Um, let me first turn to our co-chairs for any welcoming remarks. Um, so we have Dr. Catherine Varley and Mr. Mark Henry. Um, Mark, would you like to make any opening remarks? And then I'll turn to Dr. Varley. Uh, thank you all for attending, um, both those here in person and virtually. Um, I'd like to thank you all for attending and for being part of this team and for all the progress that we are making. Great. All right. Well, thank you. We have uh, Mr. Eric Keller uh, with the office of Senator Peters uh, to make a statement. Mr. Keller. I guess I'll bend down. Um, well, thank you for allowing me a moment to speak. Uh, the Senator obviously is not able to be here. Uh, he's in DC right now working on a couple things, including uh, postal reform and cybersecurity. Uh, so, you know, so I just wanted to provide a quick update since the last RAB meeting. Um, you know, I'm the Senator's regional director actually in mid Michigan now, but I, I still work on PFAS related issues and efforts on, on his behalf here in state. Uh, and since last, uh, the last update, um, NDAA, which is the National Defense Authorization, uh, that was passed in December. Uh, Congress is currently working on FY22 appropriations. Uh, I, I think there will be movement in, in the coming weeks, uh, whether, whether or not a typical omnibus process moves forward or it's a continuing resolution is yet to be seen, but they're, they're working as diligently as they can to make sure appropriations that have been set forth and been, uh, been fought for and secured through authorization actually happen. Uh, so I'll continue to update the, the board members on that piece. Uh, and I, I bring that up specifically because there's several provisions, including the creation of a, T, a PFAS uh, task force uh, over half a billion or approximately a half a billion dollars in Air Force PFAS remediation added to the budget uh, and in a variety of other components. So uh, Senator's pushing on that piece. Um, one of the, the other items that I'd like to, to mention to, to the board about uh, is what the current status is in terms of federal legislation. Uh, and, and I don't have, I think you guys gave me 20 minutes. Is that right? I'm that just joking. No. Uh, so the short of it is, uh, you know, between the house and, and I see representative Kildee's, uh, you know, representative staffer is here, Jake, uh, you know, they are working very diligently in the house. We have advocates and in, in, in leaders in the Senate, including Senator Peters, who are, are pushing forward on a variety of different proposals. I think you'll, you'll see a lot of movement from a legislative perspective over the next couple months when this session is still ongoing. Uh, most of our time recently has been focused on the American Rescue Plan and the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, there were a lot of programs in there that I think could be helpful, not only from a community perspective, but also federal dollars specifically for PFAS. Uh, lead pipe replacement, those were included in the bipartisan infrastructure law. So uh, not all of those federal programs have been rolled out yet. Uh, many federal agencies had about 180 days to develop what those programs were if it was a new program. Uh, so those will be ongoing uh, and will be rolled out, you know, this year. And then depending on the program over the series of the ne you know, next couple of years. So those are a few updates on that piece. I was hoping I had an update on a piece of legislation that the Senator introduced, but it should be forthcoming maybe even today uh, related to the FAA and airports and their transition away from using PFAS firefight, you know, latent firefighting foams uh, for dispersion issues uh, that they have. So I'll provide that information as soon as I get it as well. And as, as always, if there's things the Senator can do to be supportive of, of your collective efforts, 
uh, feel free to reach out to our office. And on behalf of the Senate, I'd just like to thank each and every one of you for your efforts in the RAB and in making sure that you're pushing the community forward on PFAS remediation because it is not an easy issue and it's not as fast as anybody really wants and the Senator feels feels that way as well. So I'd just like to thank, thank all of you for your efforts and, and I'll leave it there. All right, thank you very much for your comments, sir. And let me just check to see if we have any similar update uh, from Congressman Kildee's office um, at this time. Well, thank you, as uh, Eric said, um, Jake Bennett, uh, Deputy District Director for Congressman Kildee. I know he gave most of the updates on the legislative and appropriation side. Uh, that was pretty much covers both of that. I, I can tell you, I know I've had uh, individual conversations with some of the members as well, but we are still working with the uh, USDA on their uh, grant for the water hookups. Uh, one of the things that we are working with them on is trying to designate uh, different events that happened on base to kind of reset the clock for new grants. Uh, for to to uh, reset the, the the cap on that, I know we passed the legislation to double the amount of ECWAG uh, USDA money, and we're trying to be able to reset the clock on uh, new projects, the additional product projects, to help fund that. So that's what we're working with the USDA on, uh, still right now, trying to see if we can get more funding uh, for that program to uh, hook up some of the water as well. And the other is uh, the Congressman obviously is continuing to push for uh, much more community interaction when decision making is happening for a lot of the uh, IR process. So uh, we continue to hear from us as well. And uh, uh, I know with the redistricting, the Congressman uh, looks like the fifth district will be representing here until uh, the end of this year. So obviously we're gonna be pushing as hard as we can with the uh, little bit of time we have left for us covering this district. So thank you. And we'll be here obviously for more questions afterwards. So thanks. All right, thank you very much, sir. Okay, and so let's move to slide two for the, uh, the slide deck that we all have in, in front of us here. Um, so this meeting is, is a hybrid meeting. It's occurring both in person and online. Um, so we also have a, a court reporter online to capture a verbatim transcript of tonight's meeting. And the online meeting is being recorded as well. Um, so for the RAD members who are here in person, if you have a question, then raise hands the old fashioned way and, and let us know if you have a question. Uh, for those who are joining by computer um, via the WebEx, I think David Wynn and Rex Vaughn are are doing that. You can raise your hand electronically and then I'll call on you to pose a question. Uh, please do uh, mute your microphone when you're not speaking, um, just to minimize any background noise. Uh, we also may have a few uh, folks who have joined by, by telephone. So RAD members who have joined by telephone, uh, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and lowering it by pressing star nine again. You can mute and unmute yourself with star six. Um, and you'll show up in our displays a number only. So Sarah and I will coordinate to call on you um, and then we'll have to unmute you and then you'll have to hit star six to unmute yourself. You'll get an automated notice that you have successfully been unmuted and then you can finally say your piece. So uh, please be patient with us as we walk through that process. Uh, let's move to the, to the third slide here, the agenda. Um, so full agenda tonight, just like with most of our meetings, uh, we'll start off with some brief updates from our RAD members. Um, we'll then in, move into the RAD business items, such as action items from previous meetings. Um, after that, we'll move into the base realignment and closure, environmental construction and optimization services contract update. That's also referred to as the BCOS update. Um, and we've kept a lot of time uh, reserved towards the end of the meeting. Uh, to address RAB members' questions. So all of these portions of the agenda are for discussion among the RAB members. Um, after that, we'll have uh, the opportunity for three minute public comment from members of the public uh, to make verbal comments, whether you're here in person, have connected via the WebEx or by telephone. Um, during the technical presentation, please hold your questions to the end and we'll address those. 
And we plan to wrap all that up around eight o'clock uh, Eastern tonight. So that's our plan. Slide four um, is our list of RAB ground rules. I'll read these off and then I'll just check in with the RAB members to see if these still work. Um, number one, respect one another and maintain an atmosphere of open dialogue and exchange of ideas. Two, use our time together efficiently, wisely, and respectfully. Three, speak clearly and succinctly one person at a time, avoid interrupting others. Four, listen and remain open to different points of view. Five, maintain a propensity for progress, prepare, discuss, document, and move forward. Number six, share information early, openly, and honestly. Number seven, accurately and objectively relate to others the discussions that occur at board meetings. Let's see, um, you know, a few of these to emphasize, again, because we do have a court reporter taking a verbatim transcript, it's very hard to do that if we have multiple conversations going on or multiple people speaking at the same time. So just to re really reemphasize that uh, ground rule number three, uh, speaking succinctly, clearly one person at a time, if at all possible, please. And then also just the, the guiding ground rule of having a respectful dialogue um, and a professional exchange, I think is, is an inherent element of the Restoration Advisory Board. Let's see, so let's move to slide five. That just describes some of our public comment um, procedures as well, which we'll go into in a bit more detail. Let's see. Um, I'd like to now just move into confirming that we have our, our RAB members and confirming that we have the quorum as well. Um, let me check to see, is Bill Gaines with us? I am with you, Tim. On the phone. On phone, great. Okay, well, thank you, Bill. We appreciate that. So you're joining uh, virtually. And we have uh, Mark Henry here in person. We have Arnie LaRich in person. Do we have Scott Lingo? Okay, I believe Joe Maxwell is not with us. Okay, uh, how about Ryan Mertz? Okay, Ryan is not with us tonight. We have Greg Schultz yes. in person. We have uh, Daniel Stock in person. We have Rex Vaughn uh, virtually. Rex, are you uh, able to hear me all right? And let's do a sound check with you. Yeah, we're, we're in good shape, thank you. I, and yes, I am present. Great, all right, thank you, Rex. Also, David Wynn is connected virtually. Um, David, are you able to hear us all right? And Sarah, if we could just confirm David Wynn is unmuted. He's unmuted on our side. He's unmuted on our side. Okay. Okay, can you hear me now, Tim? Yes, we can, David. Thank you. Yep, yep, I'm here. Okay, great. And so we also have uh, Kathy Wusterbarth here in person. Welcome, Kathy. Okay, so we have more than 51% of our community RAB members here. Um, let's see. On the government RAB member uh, side, we have Dr. Catherine Varley with the Air Force uh, present in person. Uh, we have Mr. Eric Strayer with the uh, Township in person. Let's see, do we have anyone from uh, District Health Department who? Denise Bryan is present. Okay, so Denise has joined uh, virtually. Thank you, Denise. And do we have Panit Vidge with Michigan Department of Health and Human Services? Yep, yes I am. Okay, great, thanks Panit. On connected virtually. We have Beth Place with Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy in person, welcome. We have uh, Mr. Tim Cummings, Oscoda Township in person. And do we have Michael uh, Munson with us go to Wordsmith Airport Authority? Okay. So it looks like Mike is not with us right now. Um, and then we have Mr. Ben Weiss with uh, USDA Forest Service and for Jesse Stinovec. Is that right, Ben? Yes, correct. Great. All right. Thank you. Yes, you may be on the Okay. Uh, and Jesse Stinovec, are you on with us as well, connected virtually? Yep, I'm online. Okay, perfect. Okay. Well, good. We also have our chairs um, present, so we do have a quorum uh, per, per the uh, operating procedures that we amended last meeting. So thanks for your patience with that. 
Okay, well, let's move to the next slide if we could. Slide six, stakeholder updates. And so this is um, a opportunity for a brief update from our RAD members about activities of their stakeholder organizations. Um, let's move to slide seven, and that is the Air Force update. So Dr. Varley, we'll turn to you for that. So as most of you on the RAD board know, we've made some great progress with the IRA at FT002. We've continued all the way through the winter season, and we were actually putting up a wall earlier this week on the building. So we've got tanks in place. We're building the building around it. Um, everything is going according to schedule. We have had a great winter for building, even though it's cold. So progress is happening at FTO2. The uh, Vanian Lake at Ken Cliff Memorial Park is also progressing. Uh, we got back check comments from Eagle the other day. Thank you, Beth. And we are looking at those. I believe we should be getting errors from you guys soon, and we'll be moving that forward. We've also got a work plan that we are responding to your comments on. Thank you for providing comments. Um, we are also getting ready for RI field work as we are working to finalize the UFP clap. We did run into some, we are still addressing comments. That's the easiest way to put it. So, we're addressing comments and we're making progress to be able to start. Hopefully we will get a clap finalized by end of this week, if not early next week. Assuming we are able to get everything answered that we need answered. And field work for the remedial investigation is staged to begin again in April. So we stopped when it became difficult to work in the cold environments and we couldn't get drillers out here drilling. So come April, we'll be out there drilling again. Um, one thing that we have had concerns with is we've sent out several access agreements and we haven't gotten many back. So trying to understand the full extent of the plumes and where we actually need to step out to, we need access agreements. So we have asked the township for help. We've asked the airport for help. We are asking the community for help. So if you live on Vanian Lake and we haven't reached out to you or you've received a mailer from us, there's a very high likelihood that my staff will be stopping by at some point to come and talk to you and hopefully answer any questions or we'll be reaching out to you by phone if you live elsewhere. Um, but we really need that if we're going to delineate these plumes. And the goal is to have a full RI we know that there will be data gaps and we will fill those as we move forward to the FS, but to have a full RI by the end of this year. Another thing I'd like to talk about tonight is the Air Force team. This is one of the best teams I have had the pleasure to work with. I have two on-site personnel that have 19 years and 11 years of experience on this base. I have a personnel that is just 30 minutes north and he knows what has happened in history. He can find documents in a flash. I have a former regulator who knows the NCP backward forward and can tell me what the rules are and make sure that we don't overstep the rules by which we operate. I have not had a better team. And I have Steve Willis who has been overseeing the operations and maintenance contract. He is my partner in this. So we have, and they will be providing their work overview tonight. So, and Steve has been stepping in and taking on more and more projects. He's got an MMRP project coming along. He's got a VI project coming along, vapor intrusion and munitions project. And um, I have been asked, I was asked yesterday if I would accept a technical advisor position for the Air Force Civil Engineer Center. And I could not turn it down. So I'm going to try and help on a higher level in the very near future. So Steve will be taking over the program in the, eventually. And with that, um, my position will be replaced. So he will have a counterpart as well. We have built a team. The team is going to continue to function. We're going to continue to maintain our momentum. Nothing is going to stop. 
All right. Thank you, Dr. Riley. Back to you. Appreciate that. Okay, well, let's continue on. Uh, let's go to slide eight if we could. And uh, as we continue with stakeholder updates, um, we'll start off with community member updates. And typically, Mark, we start with you, but uh, if you don't mind, maybe we can start with Kathy and then we'll turn to you and, and the other community rep members. So Kathy Wisterbart, any update you'd like to provide? I, well, yes, I, and I actually have a question about the Air Force's update. Is there going to be an opportunity for us to ask questions about the things that Catherine just commented on? You want to do it now or you want to do it during a little bit? Um, but so, either way. I mean, I, they, I, I have some questions about some things that you said, yeah. and I don't know if any of them. But let's just go ahead and, and address okay. those rad members. It seems more natural to talk about it now. Yeah, just sure. mentioned it. Go ahead, Kathy. Okay, um, the remedial um, investigation, um, you, you said the access agreements were a concern and I've been contacted by a community member who received an access agreement. Okay. Um, they had concerns about the, um, the placement of additional wells on their property when they already had three wells on their property, two to three wells. Um, so there was concern about placing more. And I think the property was like 150 feet on the lakefront. But um, so I, I know that uh, they shared those concerns with me about additional wells. And I'm not familiar with the access agreement itself and you know what exactly it said. Um, they were wondering, or I've, I've heard some comments about maybe having a temporary you know, well so that we can test to see if that's really the placement that Absolutely. needed or, re, or re, even removing those other wells that maybe aren't functioning anymore. I don't know, is that part of yeah, the Yeah, absolutely. Agreement? So that is something that if they go ahead and they give us a call. So I have Ryan listed as my point of contact because he's local and he can go out and he can talk to them and help out with the placement and to make sure that if we need something, we really need it, right? Mm -hmm. To make sure that, and we do have the ability to decommission wells if we know that we will not need them. So okay, so that's sure an that's option. Possible. And we're doing, um, vertical aquifer sampling before we do any permanent wells, just to make sure we're in the right locations and we will have an understanding of where the things go. Okay. And I, I really yeah. just want to emphasize the reason you're asking for more wells is so that you can find out where the plumes are going because they Absolutely. may be going past where um, you are aware of them now. And for, I know the community members are very concerned about that plume going into Bennett and Lake. And that's, that was one of our uh, now priorities was making sure that that was captured and now defining. So uh, for community members that may have received those agreements, I can't emphasize enough that you would please contact the Air Force about asking them about your concerns and, and resolving those so that we can get that done. Thank you. And Kathy, before moving into your stakeholder update, did you have other questions? Um, so do I understand you to say that you've taken another position and you're not going to be on this site anymore? Eventually. And yeah. what time frame are you thinking that's the case? So there'll be a transition. And so they asked me to start in two weeks. However, I'm not going to take my hands off the wheel. You know me better than this, uh. right? So I was been told on other bases like last month that I had previously. He still got me in the background and I'll still be working with them and ask, answering questions and I will not, you guys can't fail. There's no way. You guys are going to be fine. Um, we've got everything, <laughs> we've got everything to contract and that we need to keep momentum moving forward for this year and we will continue. We've got good progress out there in the field and we've got the right contractors on docket. We have the A-team. We are not, it's not going to slow down. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we do need to know where those plumes end. So okay. that is the progress we need to be able to keep everything continued. All right, another, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm monopolizing here. But the, uh, you had, in order to finalize the RI, you, it sounded like you said there was an acronym and I didn't catch it. What? We are going through our, final technical reviews and making sure that we've answered all of our regulators contract con questions appropriately. So there were 168 multiple part questions. We have gone through each of them several times as a team and as individuals. 
I need to check them one more time and make sure that we don't have any other technical questions or anywhere else that we need to pivot before I put that on the street. But um, we have, like everybody else, been slowed down by COVID as far as our reviewers. And I mean, I pick up what I can and so do others that we keep going, but we are always double checking everything that we're doing because we want to make sure we get the best products out that we possibly can. Hopefully this week, that's my goal. Okay. Can I ask okay. a question on the same topic? Yeah. Go ahead, um, Arnie. How long ago did the Air Force identify that they needed these wells and when did the access agreement requests go out? So we've been using the BAS data as we've been collecting it to determine where we need to step out. So this summer, really. However, we had ideas and those have pivoted since, right? From the very beginning of where we could need wells. So we still need to have a SPP meeting with Eagle and determine, so a team meeting with our regulators to determine where those wells will actually be. But we have a starting point. And what we have really is we need to go in there and we need to see if the plumes are actually entering Benny and Lake or elsewhere, something that we can address now versus waiting. Right. No, I know why you need some, but I'm trying to understand and find out how we can help the community members who receive these to understand the importance of it, but also their concerns, as Kathy mentioned. So how long have they had these uh, letters or requests from the Air Force and when do you actually need them? Yeah, so first round were sent, Sarah, when was the first round sent? Last fall. Last fall. Last fall. And then we sent a second round for anybody that didn't respond to us just a few weeks ago. And, and let me pause real quick just to check uh, audio. I saw a note that one person connected virtually was having difficulty hearing. Uh, Quentin, are you able to hear the audio right now? It is very faint, um, so if everyone could speak up a little bit, that would be great. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you. And so especially for the RAD members and especially those who have mics in front, if we can kind of direct the conversations toward that microphone rather than looking back and forth, that, that'll cause it to sometimes go in and out a bit. Sorry for the- Okay, I would only thing. suggest in the future, because you're on the crunch time now. Yeah. If you sent them out last fall, this is the first, I think, that the community rehab has heard about this. I have not seen a copy, an example copy of one to see what's involved to our community members making a decision. This is the second phase of these vertical sampling. Uh, I think the first one was about two years ago. There were about seven of those put out and they agreed to have them done. So. I, I think a little bit more communication on. Okay, so this. I have a phone of friend speaking <laughs> up, and it was mentioned during the November meeting. This is not the first time that the access agreements were mentioned. And requests were sent out in December. We talked about it during the last round. Okay, but we don't have a copy. Of, we don't know what's being asked of it's our citizens. People's property lines and asking if we can put. Oh, oh. A vertical aquifer sample in. This is a sensitive issue on, on access agreements in this area okay. with multiple government entities. So it, it's something that uh, for the future, uh, a process that we're all on the same page and we can help you, you. with more detail on, on, in the future. So okay. if you think of something that we can do, we're going to try to make it happen because. We can't slow this down anymore. I agree. Right. And how many do you need? It all depends on how many we get and what we find out as we go. So really, what we need is about 15. 50, five, zero? One, five. One, five. Oh. In the right locations. And can you give share a map with us of the general areas? Not the property lines, because we don't need personal information, but just where are you looking in general with a map of Yes, those will that'll all be, be great to share with us. 
okay. in the clap. I'm hoping to get out as soon as possible. So and I future. will send you to the page, yeah. Arnie. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, so let me just see if there are any follow-up questions on the Air Force uh, stakeholder update. Any additional questions? Okay. And uh, Sarah, do you see any questions from MRAD members online right now? Right. Okay, well, so let's continue with the stakeholder updates. And uh, Kathy, I believe you, you have an update to provide as well. So this is slide eight for those of us uh, we're looking at this slide. Yes, and thanks so much for including the slide for me. I, I really just wanted to emphasize some of the concerns that the uh, community has. Uh, again, I'm Kath Kathy Boosterbarth, and I am part of the Now Need Our Water Community Action Group. Um, part of our concern, uh, the first, is the priorities for the remedial investigation. Um, the process, from what I understand, is finalized and then it's presented to the uh, RAB. Um, and we would like to be part of that process before it's finalized. Um, it, I believe the process doesn't allow for that at this time. And we certainly would like to be part of that. Um, and then next, the the IRAs, um, we do have one that's you know in process right now. That's the you know inter interim remedial actions for those who are um, just coming in. Um, those are the actions that the uh, pro circular process can take um, if there's imminent and substantial threat to human and humans in the environment. So um, if there's something that's identified in the area, you know, uh, for the area that needs action right now, which is what we've done a couple of IRAs right now, um, then the Air Force can take action to clean those up before we go into the remedial investigations. So um, um, I do wanna keep that open that there's you know, potentially more IRAs that could be you know, needed in this area because of the extent of contamination on this site. Um, just to keep that, you know, our minds open for that because, um, you know, it's, it's a, um, it, just that there are some uh, sites that might be potentially um, applicable to an IRA. And then um, the next bullet point was that there, because we did have some IRAs in process, uh, the public made some comments, uh, hundreds of comments, I think. <laughs> Uh, and we have yet to uh, see what the responses from the Air Force were on those comments. We'd like to see those in the in the records, in the they Air are. Force record. There are on the MFR in the record of decision responsiveness summary. Okay, and including all of the correct all of I, them, not I, a, not just RAB members or but correct the, I all everything. Members. So they're summed up because we had hundreds of them. The ones right. were similar were summed together and answered, right? Oh, right, because, because they we were similar. Because we didn't get a lot of similar questions as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. But the response to this summary has absolutely everything in it and answered. Okay. All right. That's that's important because we want to be able to utilize that so that we can, if there are future IRAs, we want to be able to understand you know, the process or what, what the Air Force is thinking in absolutely. terms of those. And everything that's used to make a decision goes on the administrative record. Okay, well, thank you very much. And lastly, we are awaiting a response from the Air Force um, for that the uh, the letter that the the governor had um, written, and I don't believe we have a response to that yet. They um, she did speak up for us in terms of requesting uh, that amendment for the cooperative agreement, and we would really like to have a response for that. Did that go to OST? Do you? DOD. DOD. Okay. So that was went to kids' office. In um, last March, that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, before moving off of this this slide and this topic, any follow-on questions from the airport about Kathy's update needed? Not at this time. Okay. Okay, well, let's move to slide nine, if we could. And so we continue in the stakeholder updates portion and the community RAP members updates. Uh, let's start with our community co-chair, uh, Mark Henry. Mark, any, any updates you'd like to provide? I do not have any updates. Okay. All right, thank you. Let's go down the list. Uh, how about uh, Bill Gaines, who's uh, connected virtually. Uh, Bill, any updates that you'd like to provide? No comments at this time, thank you. Okay, thanks, Bill. And to Arnie Larich. 
Uh, just one, um, and that is a lot has been shared with uh, the RAB and a lot of improvements have been made since you've been here the last two years. Um, I would only suggest that there'd be a little bit more understanding of the community members and the community RAB members, the community in general, as we were just talking about them in the access agreement. And how difficult it can be for them to understand the circle process, the acronyms, everything. You guys live it, we don't. And for three years, we've been asking for one particular thing, and that is a complete list of the sites by name and located on a map, a list and on a map. You gave us a map. With all the sites on it. But Let's right, but let, it needs... Uh, Arnie, go ahead and, and finish, then I'll turn okay, to the sorry. question. Go ahead, Arnie. It, it needs to be completed, and we need the list that matches the list. So I've got an example, and every RAP meeting, it should be updated so that when we're here, we can see exactly what you're talking about. So that's one example, and I've, I've got an example from another site. Doesn't have to be followed exactly, but I think you get an idea of every RAB meeting is an update of this map so that when you're talking about it, your contracts, whatever, we can see it. The public has it because they can download it from the site. So that's on the, that one issue of this map and the list. The other one is more recently, over the last year and a half, we've been asking multiple, Mark, myself, others, been asking for the conceptual site models that are in the QAP. Uh, and that is a iterative process. It's always changing. That's what we've been told. However, in response to our requests on that action, those action items, the response has been, well, that's going to be finalized when the RI work plan is, is completed. We've been waiting for nearly two years for whatever the current conceptual site model that the agencies are using to manage the process. And other sites provide that, like in the site inspection phase two and a half years ago, they did, they provided one in the ESI, the extended site, in the relative risk, they updated it. It's a progression. And, and we, are, we have not been shared that, so that's another suggestion. Did you see the posters outside this wall? I did not see. You didn't see all the posters we had? Yes, I did. Those show all the data as we've been collecting it every time. It's what I'd too, like to do eventually. Let me let sorry. Dr. Barley respond. Go ahead. Is put the before next to the after. We are honing in on what the data is actually showing so we can actually make progress and do actual work versus just investigate for forever. So I would like to make sure that that happens, that they show a before versus an after. As because we are not where we started two years ago. We have thousands of data points that we did not have two years ago. We understand the site so much better than we understood it two years ago. And that CSM is going to drive what we do. It's going to drive the next IRAs. It's going to drive our next projects. And it will keep on moving us forward. And you're right, it is not a static process. It is iterative, mm -hmm. it continues to go. And every RAB, you should see more and more. And all those previous posters are being put up on the Air Force website. So you can see them at any time. You can zoom in on them. And hopefully that helps explain the sites and how we're moving forward. Yes. Go ahead, respond. Arnie, I think that the Air Force did provide us a map of all the IRP sites. But you're correct. I don't think I have seen a list of the IRP sites. And they are listed in other reports, the annual reports, operational reports, but it's so scattered that the public and the community members, I'll speak for myself, cannot connect the detail that's out on those posters 
and you're doing great progress and a lot of work being done. But to connect that to where we are on the circular process, and right now we're talking about the RI work plan slash starting the sampling for the RI. But we don't see where in this process, like the risk assessment for wildlife, okay? That's what we're talking about. What's what you're talking about a little bit more and more. But where is it in the, the risk assessment matrix? What does it fit in the circle process? This diagram is used as a best practice that EPA published for federal agencies to follow. We'd appreciate it if you could share what you've got in your <clears throat> ongoing quap that you use every month, probably to some extent. On a quarterly basis, share us with us an example of it. Thanks, Arne. Sounds, sounds like some I have ongoing... copies that I can leave with you. So it sounds like there may be some ongoing conversation about that. But site list as well. Um, staying in our, our stakeholder updates, um, Greg Schultz, anything that you'd like to No, not this time. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Mr. Daniel Stock. Uh, no comment. Thanks, Dan. And over to Rex Vaughn. I'm Rex, good, guys. Keep it moving on. <laughs> Keep it moving on. All right. Uh, David Wynn. David, did you have any comments you'd like to share? Any updates? Yes. Can you hear me fine? Yes, sir. Um, I just I want to I don't know if it's a comment, but I I want to I want to pose this right now based off the RAB. Um, during the last RAB meeting on November twenty first on November, um, I gave a well done a well job well done attaboy to Air Force and Aerostar for the um, critical uh, removal for FTO two. All right, that statement was printed in the October Ascoda Press shortly after that meeting. The reason I bring this up is that during a December 9th Senate hearing on PFOS, Deputy Assistant Secretary Kidd used my statement from the Escota Press to make the Senate committee think that all the activities past and present at Wordsmith are going just fine and everything, there's no issue. All right, first, I gave that attaboy to the team because of the critical, the critical uh, removal action uh, being removed, a PFOS site that we've talked about for time and time again, a long time. Second, I'm truly disappointed and dismayed, but not surprised that DOD management would make would mis make a mischaracterization of my statement for their own beneficial gain to make the Senate committee believe that everything at Wordsmith is going just fine. I thought that the goal moving forward was to be to work between the Air Force and community and trust and transparency. Thanks to Mr. Kidd, his misguided statement, my trust going forward is in check. So Catherine, I sure hope that you or your team bring it back to your management to let them know that I'm not very pleased with Mr. Kidd and his mis misguided statements to the Senate committee and, Mr. and Senator Peter's uh, office. Thank you. David, thank you for uh, sharing that concern with us. Uh, we will continue on with stakeholder updates and let's move to the government RAD members if we could. Um, so uh, Jesse Stinebeck with uh, USDA Forest Service, is there anything that you'd like to provide? There's nothing I'd like to provide. I'll ask Ben though, since he's right there, um, if he wants to provide anything. Ben? Yes, thank you. So the Forest Service is we are very pleased with the progress from FTL2 and the extraction wells that are going to be along Clark's Marsh. So we see a very immediate benefit to the Clark's Marsh area. This will remove a lot of contamination from further entering the marsh. And so we're, you know, I feel like we're, the Forest Service, we've, we've been engaged and we're deeply concerned about what's going on in the community. And we're now at the point where this is affecting um, US Forest Service lands. And so we're, we're happy to see progress made and we're very happy to see where this RI leads us, the remedial investigation, which 
issues. It will be the mapping of where contaminants are in the ground. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you very much for that update, Ben. And let's go to Beth Place with the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy. Okay, thank you. Um, we just wanted to thank Catherine for um, overseeing um, the work for this part of the RI and the progress made at the site. Um, just as we thank you know Dan Medina and Matt Myers in the past, so we do appreciate your work on, on this project and hope that it continues at a fast pace in the future. Um, as Catherine mentioned earlier, um, we have provided the back check to the comments on the Van Etten Lake record of decision. The ARARs, um, so the state standards are still with our AG's office and Eagle, and I know Air Force Legal and our Attorney General's office have been going back and forth on those. Those are with us right now. We hope to provide um, the, our comments back on the ARARs table within the next two weeks. That's our timeline for that. We also, Eagle is currently reviewing the, we're currently reviewing um, the Air Force response to Eagle comments on the risk assessment. We'll be providing our back check on that prior to the end of the month. We've already provided um, our back check on the majority of the eco risk comments. So we still have the human health comments to back check. Um, we'll also be providing our comments on the biota sampling plan by the end of the month. Um, we also wanted to mention that we have a we met with the Need Our Water group, and we also met with the community co-chair of the RAB within the past month. And so we do appreciate those conversations. Um, we will be setting up a meeting with the Forest Service in the near future to discuss a few items as well on the Wordsmith project. Um, as far as access agreements, I know that was something that you mentioned. I know currently our AG's office and DNR are actively discussing um, the access agreements on state land. So we're hoping that there will be progress made on that in the near future as well. And we do have a MPART a town hall meeting for the former Wordsmith Air Force Base and the work that the state does in the Oscoda area. And that will be um, on March 2nd, the first week in March. Those are my updates. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. We appreciate that. And let's uh, continue on to slide 10, if we could. Uh, Michael Munson with the Scotia Wordsmith Airport Authority is not with us, I believe. And just to verify that, Sarah, you don't have Michael Munson on connected virtually, do you? Okay. All right, well, let's uh, go to Mr. Eric Stray with our Sobble Township. Uh, nothing at this time. Thank you. Thank you. And to Puneet Bidge with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Puneet, anything? Um, Okay, uh, as Beth already mentioned, we have a Wordsmith uh, town hall meeting planned for March 2nd. Uh, and in that meeting, I'm going to discuss resampling rounds uh, one and two numbers, like uh, non detects, detects, anything uh, above comparison value or below comparison value, um, along with the figures where you'll see all these de detections and, uh, and non detects according to the area of concern. So um, that's pretty much I have in terms of updates. Okay, thank you, Puneet. And if you'd like to uh, email me that update, then I can get that out to the RAB members as well. And, and uh, we, can, we can make sure that's recorded in the sure. transcript here. Yep, I can, uh, I can email you. Great, all right, thank you. And let's go to Tim Cummings with us, go to Township. Yes, thank you. Uh, this comment uh, on behalf of us, go to Township is directed at Dr. Varley. Uh, in learning this evening of your eventual transition, uh, I'm, I'm recalling some years ago, uh, as we've had several program managers on this project um, that we've been meeting with for some, some years, five, six years that I've been on this, uh, involved with the Air Force, that it's a common understanding within the Air Force that the program managers that were assigned prior to you were, were given that position on their way to retirement. 
and that it was not a project that anyone particularly looked forward to. It was not a popular assignment. And now with your transition, I'm like a, a prior speaker here on the community grab, and a little bit disappointed in that, you know, in the last meeting I gave credit to the uh, Air Force and all the progress that's been made. And now I'm wondering just how much progress we're going to continue to make. Um, you know, these, these kind of uh, are kind of a quicksilver change of hats every couple of years does not spell well to uh, building confidence in this community that has been uh, quite honestly uh, beaten up, beaten down on the subject of contamination. That's Thanks, Tim. Thank can you. I go ahead and respond on that? Of course you can. All right. So the difference here is that I am being promoted yeah. to a technical advisor position that oversees a lot more than just this environmental group. And hopefully I can help make bigger change that will affect us all. I'm also not going hands off. I never have. I'm still consulting when asked and when needed on all of the former bases that I've been involved with. And I continue to keep that, you know, as long as I'm not told I'm not wanted here, I will be around here and there. So I do have family in Michigan. I look forward to holding you to this. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. Okay, let's turn to Denise Bryan with the Department of Health District 2. Any updates for us, Denise? Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to make one note as we are in mid-February that when we see the thaw, we will again probably experience the foam issues on Van Etten and um, also the Ostable has been identified. And I know we have signs on Van Etten Lake but I also think that um, every spring, summer, this becomes a concern for residents and visitors in the area. And I just um, am hoping that there's further um, review of the foam and perhaps what that means. We certainly understand the importance of rinsing foam off our children and selves and animals. But I wondered if anybody's moving forward with um, evaluating the foam situation. Thank you, Denise. We appreciate that update. And let's see, let me just check in with the RAD members. Any further discussion needed on those updates before we move to RAD business on slide 11? Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, is, uh, did, well, I believe there was a meeting with um, Dr. Varley and the township about um, access or about um, oh gosh. Not our partnership, right? Storm, it's stormwater sewers, not well, our pipelines and our pipelines. Of water. That's yes. right. So, can someone are, give an update on that? Yeah, so we've been working towards an ESCA, an environmental service agreement, to be able to line the storm, well, the water conveyance line infrastructure and to move forward together so that when we look at so and the partnerships also with the airport when we look at Worsmith as a whole and the air surrounding area we're not just looking at what was the base but what is township now and what is OA and we're coming up with the overall solution so we are supporting each other in every aspect of what we do Thanks. Okay, well, so let's um, go ahead and move into the RAD business portion of the agenda. On slide 12, it just uh, indicates one element of that, uh, specifically action items. Uh, so as per usual practice, the co-chairs met following the last RAD meeting and reviewed action items. There are currently 10 open action items and two ongoing action items. And I believe the plan is to, to do that same process again, to have a meeting with co-chairs and myself, review action items, and, and uh, plan upcoming meetings. Does that make sense, co-chairs? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, let's see. We'll, at that time, review any additional action items that might be captured tonight. Uh, last meeting, we um, updated the RAV operating procedures, and the co-chairs signed those. 
Uh, so we do have uh, parent procedures effective as of 17 November of 2021. And at the same time, Rex Vaughn, Greg Schultz, and Scott Lingo were um, inducted as community rap members as well. Um, Co-chair, is anything else you'd like to add in relation to RAB business? So Steve will be transitioning into the Beck role, so I'd like to include him as we go over this meeting in our next session. Right. Mark, anything that you'd like to add there? No. Any further discussion on RAB business? This is uh, I don't think Eagle received the action items after the last meeting. Is I sent them out to the RAB, I believe. So I can look back. Okay, thank you. I try to send everything out as a RAB update, so okay. it's usually attached. If I missed it, I apologize, but I'm not sure that we have them. Okay. I'll check. Thank you, Beth. Arnie, you had a comment. And I think you've tried to or have the AIs for the action items for tonight's meeting to capture which ones were added, new ones, and send those out to the whole wrap prior to and maybe a week of time in between before you three meet to go over them. Is that correct? They're caught in our meeting minutes. So we go over them in our meeting minutes. We try and meet the, that week after. And that's where they're captured. That's where they're captured? The new action items. They go up on the website. Those meeting minutes are added to the website and sent out to the team as well. And we go over the existing action items to see if there are any changes or updates. Okay. Well, what's kind of missing that we used to have is that within two weeks after a RAP meeting, the community RAP would meet and go over what we heard what action items we think, and then the co-chair, and I was then, would have that input from our 11 hour. And, and then you go with that information. And so you, it's just something I think that we've, we've lost along the way. And I think we're only talking about a week and a half additional time maybe before you have your sit down to actually crunch through status change and things like that. So it sounds like your suggestion I would be for the, uh, the RAD members, the community RAD members as well to have the opportunity to propose what they heard as an action item uh, prior to that meeting right. between the co-chairs as they review the action item list. Is that right? Right. Yeah. And especially if we added one, we should be able to know exactly yeah it was understood it was captured or it wasn't because okay. we've had duplicates created and they just little versions of an earlier one and that just confuses everything okay. so there's any immediate thought on on that suggestion or is that something to consider when you meet next we'll talk about it next time. make it an action item <laughs> an action Make item about action item. Very good meta action item. Great. Great. Okay, well, so um, we are now at the, uh, the segment of tonight's meeting where we'll dive into the Air Force technical presentation. Um, we have, let's see, again, that BCOS acronym, the Base Realignment and Closure Environmental Construction Optimization Services contract. Of the first six months, Jay Mullet with Wood is here to provide an update. Jay? Good evening, everybody. Uh, Jay Mullet with Wood. I am the uh, project manager for, for Wood on behalf of the Air Force. Um, we are in a contract on the BCOS contract. Um, as a sub to the uh, LADA um, CTI joint venture. And um, I'm going to give you guys an update. We took over the contract uh, basically the beginning of July of 21. And so this would be an update for the first six, seven months of the contract. So um, um, the contract, the Beast Coast Hunt contract, uh, the predominant objectives of this contract are uh, remedial action operations, which is the continuing operation and maintenance of the treatment systems on base, along with the uh, long-term monitoring program um, for a lot of the uh, IRP sites. Um, in addition to that, uh, the contract also involves long-term management, which is basically land use controls, 
um, inspections, um, you know, inspections and uh, documenting that the land use controls are in place. Um, for the for the year 21, um, we completed our annual sampling event um, where we uh, we sampled 148 monitoring wells, 23 purge wells. Um, all of this work uh, took place between uh, predominantly July and September of 21. Um, we did our land use control inspections. Those included interviews with property owners, and um, um, we uh, completed that work in October and November of last year. Um, and uh, in addition, we did an annual groundwater gauging event that we used to update our model and update the, uh, the capture plumes, uh, the capture of the systems. Um, that gauging event uh, took place uh, last week in November, first week of December of 21, um, where we uh, gauged 450 locations um, across the base. So that's 450 monitoring wells, um, gauged the entire network along with uh, um, staff gauges in Van Atten Lake uh, at the dam along with Clark's Marsh. Um, so this uh, obviously the 2021 data will be presented in annual port reports that are forthcoming um, that we are in progress of, uh, of developing and will be submitting to the Air Force soon. Um, just a brief update on, on the systems. Um, the operation and maintenance in includes the uh, operating of four treatment systems. Um, the FTO2 system, this is the existing system. Um, over the last six months of 21, our, our first six months of operations, July through December, um, we treated 54 million, uh, excuse me, 54 million gallons of water um, that was treated in the FTO2 system. The system was sampled in accordance with the uh, SRDs, which are the substantive um, um, discharge requirements. Um, um, and we uh, sampled monthly and weekly um, in accordance with those regulations. And um, we also did uh, optimization efforts to improve flow rates, um, included purge well cleaning, purge well replacement, pump cleaning. Um, we cleaned the conveyance lines with a high pressure, high compression air um, to increase flow rates. Um, but overall, uh, the FTO2 system um, ran very well. Yes, sir. Did you have to replace any wells? We did not have to replace any wells, correct. Um, in addition, we did carbon change outs. Um, about every 100 days, um, change outs at FTO2 occurred in August and November of 21. Um, so basically the sampling dictates when we need to do those change outs in uh, FTO2. Um, we're, we're pretty much on a regimented about every 100 days right now when we're changing out those carbon vessels. So. Um, the next system I'll talk about is the central treatment system. Um, this system, we treated 57 million gallons of water, um, sampled the system uh, weekly and monthly in accordance with the uh, SRDs. Um, we, uh, we completed carbon changeouts at the central plant in December, where we changed out two of the carbon vessels. Um, uh, and uh, that was dictated by, obviously, the data. Um, the previous tree, uh, changeouts were in February, so we were able to uh, see those, uh, those plants run for, the, the carbon run for about nine months um, before changeout. Um, optimization efforts that we did do um, included some mechanical and chemical well treatment um, to improve some efficiencies um, on a couple of the wells that were, were not at target. Um, we were able to see a 21% increase in flow rates um, by doing those chemical and uh, mechanical well treatments. Um, we also did uh, replace flow meters. We cleaned pumps. We pulled pumps. Um, we replaced a couple of pumps. We also uh, uh, did some cleaning of the conveyance lines, once again, with high pressure air, but also with uh, high pressure water jetting uh, to improve flow and uh, improve efficiency of the system. Um, Overall, the system ran very well in, in the last six months of 21, and uh, we'll see continued efficiencies this year. Can I ask a quick question? Sir. Uh, those two systems, you treated the exact same amount, 54 million gallons. FTO2 is a much smaller unit than Central. I know Central is not operating at max capacity design, but it's still a lot larger than 
the CO2. That number is correct? Is yeah, 54 million and 57 million. That is correct, sir. Um, Central is has a much bigger capacity. We're only running it at about half capacity right now. Um, and we're just pulling in water from the, the former benzene and Arrow Street purge wells. But uh, the, it's running at about the same capacity at, as FTO2 currently. Now, there is much more um, much more of capacity to run it. Um, at a, it it's, it's actually rated for 500 GPM. But it, and that's part of what the IRA is, is, is adding those additional wells um, to treat more water at Central. So um, and it, additional capacity. Correct. Correct. Sorry. So the IRA will not only right. take up what's currently there, but it will add additional it, capacity and take up more. Yes, it's adding the capacity for an additional 500 GPM. So a total of 1,000 GPM. A year and a half ago, we were told that the, the GAC Central was operating at about 100 of available capacity was not being used. Uh, but that seems to be a lot less being pumped through it than, uh, than we were told soon after it was started in 2018. Well, keep in mind, this is only the last six months. So I, I don't want to, th okay. this is just July through December. So this is only for the length of the BCOS contract. Right. Right. So, oh, so six months yeah. review is what we've been. Yeah, doing. this is sort of a six month snapshot here. Okay. Sir, did you have a question? Just out of curiosity, when you clean the conveyance lines, did you have a lot of uh, biofouling within those lines? Yes. Yeah. There is biofouling. There's a, there's obviously a lot of metals out here as well. All those things play into that that restriction that uh, you know obviously impacts that flow. So. Um, that is something that we will continually do is uh, clean out those lines um, to improve that efficiency. A possible thought to help the public understand these numbers and how they stay the same or they change is uh, possibly on an annual basis that there's a chart or maybe every six months, there's just an ongoing chart for these systems to, to show what's happening with them. I think public would understand that versus they get well, a presentation like this. And our goal was to get up to speed as far as all the documents that were out there. So we're getting, those are all in long-term monitoring and REO reports. So you have all the access to those up through 2019. We're working on finalizing the 2020 reports right now. And then you'll have all that information at your hands. I'm, I'm not so, getting Catherine, on this topic of let me uh, let me turn to Arnie first to finish his question, and then I'll turn to those who are on the line. Go ahead, Arnie. The the public needs to have it on a single chart for each system, or actually all three systems on a chart for every every year to be able to see what's going on. These systems are going to operate thirty years. I'm not going to be around, but so it, it would behoove us as a group to kind of have this analysis put out on an annual or every other wrap in a way that they will understand and see it, the progress. So Air Force collects that information monthly in their monthly technical status reports. So I think that they do have the information to be able to do that. Thank you. I'm sorry, could you tell me who was just speaking? Beth Place, sorry. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Quintana, did you have a, a, a previous question? Uh, no, she answered it, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, well Jay, let's uh, turn back to you. Okay, um, we'll turn to slide 17 for those that are viewing slides. Um, uh, update on the Mission Street pump and treat system. Um, the Mission Street system, we, we, um, we treated 43 million gallons of water, um, sampled the system weekly, uh, monthly in accordance with the SRDs. Um, we uh, did see some, uh, we did do some optimization there as well, some purge well cleaning, um, including pump replacement. Um, pump cleaning. We also, uh, the one, if folks that are seeing the slides, we did do a retrofit um, with the bag filter assembly at the mission system in December. Um, 
We were changing out bag filters about every 45 days on average um, with the retrofit of adding um, the additional skid with uh, six, oh, excuse me, did I say 45 days? My bad, 45 hours. Um, with the, uh, the new assembly um, where we added six bag filters, we increased that frequency or that duration um, to 155 hours on average. And that's only been placed in place for the last, uh, about last six weeks. Um, so it's had some very positive, uh, major positives to the system. Um, obviously reducing back pressure on the resin, which will increase the longevity um, of that resin material. Um, and also um, it's decreased the amount of downtime that the system is up and running. Um, when we were changing out the bags every 40, 45 hours, um, we were basically shutting the system down every other day for about a half hour to an hour to do that. Now we're only shutting the system down about an hour a week. Um, so it, it may be small in context, it's really only a couple of extra hours of uptime, but you stretch that out over the course of a, of a year and it will have some significant improvement on the uptime of the system. We have a question, Jay, go ahead, Mark. I have two questions. Right. Uh, first of all, the bag filter that was added to the mission drive system, is that the one that had been at the fire training area? That has, that is the system. So we were able to uh, reclaim that and reuse it. Um, so it was definitely a good way to uh, be able to apply that. Correct. Uh, second question is, um, uh, bag filters are um, labor intensive. Um, have you looked at other technologies to replace bag filters? We have looked at other technologies, and I think eventually we'd like to, to move into a, a, a you know, a, t a type of filter or sand filter that we will have to, we can eliminate bag filters in the future. Um, but for the time being, this was a way that we could extend that life and uh, certainly better the system's efficiency. Um, but we are going to be looking at that over the course of BCOS, um Certainly over the next year or two, we've, we've got some ideas about some, some filtration systems that will uh, eliminate the use of bag filters altogether. Thank you. Yep. All right, the last system I'll touch on is uh, the Landfill 3031, the engineered wetland treatment system. Um, over the last six months of 21, we treated uh, over 70 million gallons of water. Um, we. Uh, you know, optimization, once again, we did a lot of purge well cleaning and maintenance. Um, we did some mechanical well screen cleaning on uh, purge well five. Um, we saw about an 11% increase in flows off of that well after the cleaning. So we are seeing some improvement. Um, we did go ahead and um, we cleared a lot of trees and um, a vegetation, that, uh, woody vegetation that was growing around the ponds that would, you know, in order to, uh, make sure that we had stability in our banks. Um, we, we removed some of those um, that were uh, that we were at risk of uh, reducing the stability of the banks on the ponds. Um, but overall, um, the sampling at the system was completed in accordance with regulations and um, the system ran um, according to plan. So um, I don't have any other updates in regards to uh, the BECOS contract, um, but um, as I mentioned before, um, we are uh, continuing to con our operations and maintenance. All of our data that we uh, collected last year um, we'll be presenting in uh, some future uh, forthcoming annual reports. Okay, well, thank you. And Kathy Wisterbarth, we'll have a question with you, and then I'll turn to those who are on the phone, the rad members who are connected uh, virtually. So, Kathy? Yeah, um, just a small detail. You had mentioned some tree clearing. Mm -hmm. Anytime I hear about um, removal of items on, on the base, I, want, I worry about that. So uh, where, what actually became of the trees or, you know, shrubs or that you brought? They were, they were left on site, but we just moved them away from the banks so okay. they weren't growing in and, 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 you know, reducing the integrity of those banks. So they're, okay. they're still on the landfill site. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So let me just turn to our RAV members who are connected virtually. Do we have any questions uh, from those of you who've connected to the computer or phone? Nope. Okay. All right, so Mark Henry. One final question. Um, do you do influence sampling in the treatment wetland or in the system, even above the waterfall for PFAS? In the wetland system? Well, the landfill 3031 treatment system. 
begins with a landfall and, or excuse me, begins with a waterfall, ends in uh, uh, perking into the ground. Do you test the water going into that system for PFAS? I don't believe we're sampling for PFAS in landfill 3031. No, we are not. Just VOCs and metals is what we. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions from the RAB members on this update? Okay, well, Jay, thank you very much for that update. Thank you, folks. All right. Well, let me uh, just check in with our co chairs. We had scheduled a uh, 620 to 630 break, which is pretty much right on time. Are we good to take a 10 minute break now and continue on? All right, so we will move into a 10 minute break. We'll come back at 630 and uh, continue on from there. Just a note to those of us who are right here, the mics will still be um, active and uh, please use the handrails as you walk down those steps that can be electric. Thanks. Thank
Okay, welcome back. It is uh, 6.30, so we will continue our Restoration Advisory Board meeting. We're on slide 19, RAD member questions. And let's see. Uh, so this is an opportunity for the RAD members to engage in just additional discussion um, and ask questions, uh, have some additional dialogue. Uh, again, if you're here in person and have questions, please just raise your hand. Um, I will also check in with those who are connected uh, virtually. Um, you, you should already be unmuted, and so if you unmute yourself, we'll be able to hear you. Um, and then if anyone has, any RAD members have dialed in by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine, lower it by pressing star nine again. You can mute and unmute yourself with star six. So uh, let me first turn to our RAD members who are connected virtually to see if you have any questions uh, for the group. All right, David Wan, go ahead, sir. Um, I have two questions. My first question is, is I, I understand Catherine is, is, is taking on a new project. So in my understanding, and I, my understanding is that Steve Willis is gonna take over her role in, in this, in working with the project team. I'd like to understand, and I think the RAD would probably like to understand, what is Steve's technical background and is it such the same as what Catherine's technical background is? Great. Thank you, David. And Steve, would you like to address that one? Sure, so uh, I started my career, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I started my career with the Air Force um, back in 1985, working on B-52s that were actually stationed here at Wordsmith. Uh, I was a structural engineer doing depot maintenance on them at uh, Kelly Air Force Base, which is now a BRAC base and is closed. So I've kind of come full circle from working at an active base to now working at a closed base where B-52s were stationed. Um, when the base closed, I transitioned from the aerospace industry into the environmental field. Uh, I was actually a, a support contractor for what was the predecessor of AFCAC, it was AFSI, for about five years. In the last 16 or so years, I've worked for URS AECOM doing uh, environmental cleanup and MMRP work. And now I'm back with the Air Force again. Okay, that, and that's great. But I guess where I'm going is, um, Catherine, correct me if I'm wrong. You, you, based off your doctorate's degree, you, you understand geology, you understand toxicology, and so on and so forth. Steve, do you understand that amount of work? So I guess my whole point in this, is if you don't, is there someone, a supplemental person that's gonna come in and join the group that's gonna take up that, that role? I, ha I have an understanding of, of comprehensive environmental projects. Like I said, I've been a project manager the last 16 years. So I'm not a toxicologist, but I work with them. I understand the language. Um, I work with risk assessors. I've worked with chemists. I work with biologists. I work with geologists. So yes, I understand the process. I understand the various fields required in environmental investigation and cleanup. Um, but uh, as the program manager, I can bring all those fields together. Hey, David, I'd like to answer your question as well. So we have built a team that has toxicologists, has hydrologists. You have met Janet Anderson. You have met uh, Jane Ann Bond. You have met our soil scientist, Hunter Anderson. You have met John Gillespie back in the day. All these people will continue to support this group. Everybody they've been working with, Colin Plank, we have a good solid technical team. Plus we have Andrea and Ryan, they're here on site. And as you have questions and you have needs, we will continue to answer your questions and we will continue to answer your needs. This team is solid. And right now my management confirmed with me today that they are going out for more expertise to fill my position. So this team will be strong and will proceed. Okay. That's my only concern, Catherine, is I just wanna make sure, uh, and I think the other RAB members wanna make sure because my, my question or concern is the people before you, your predecessors before you, uh, Matt Mars and Dave Gibson, I don't think either one of them had any kind of a technical background, therefore, it was not as beneficial as to the current team that you have now. So I just want to make sure, and that's the reason for my question, 
is to make sure that the team is still as solid as the team that you currently have right now. Absolutely. The team is solid. Okay. That's my first question. My second question is, uh, Steve, and I'd like you and maybe Beth to explain. Um, I think in the last RAB meeting, we talked a little bit about the, the lateness of the BCT meeting minutes. Um, since then, I've seen that you've been able to update a lot of those BCT minute minutes, um, as well as, uh, you know, Beth has updated them and put them on the MPART website. As I also understand, and I believe that there's a, a different process now of how the BCT minutes are going to be administered and, and brought in, in so that the community has access to them. Can you explain, and I'd like Beth to also explain this different process so that we as a community and we as the RAB have assurance going forward that the BCT minutes, based on when the BCT minutes be meetings happen, that we are going to be in, in know of what's going on and not six months down the road. Okay, let's start with Steve Willis and then we'll go to Beth. Go ahead, Steve. So we're actually looking at revamping the BCT process in general. Uh, the, the meetings have evolved over time into more of a review of action items and the status of reports and documents, um, and, and less so on focusing on technical topics and uh, reviewing them and coming to an agreement on a plan forward. And so we're shifting them back into more of that realm. We're trying to pick some topics with real meat to them, uh, put together a, a briefing package, providing it to Eagle ahead of time so that they can prepare and we can come to this meeting, discuss a topic, come to some agreement on, on the plan forward for it, and the minutes would be much briefer than they have been, basically documenting the agreements reached in the meeting, and then it's, we'll review them, uh, we'll give them the Eagle for review, and then once they're finalized, we'll provide those to the RAB. Okay, but so, but I understand that the Air Force is going to release a set of meeting minutes um, to the RAB, which I, I, as you just said, and then uh, I, as I understand, Eagle will review those minutes. And then also if there are any additional comments that Eagle doesn't agree, disagree, agree with, they will then update that and put it on the MPART website. Beth, is that correct or incorrect? So that's pretty much correct. So the, the Air Force generates the first round of minutes that comes to us as a draft final. We review them. It goes back to Air Force. They finalize them. At that point, um, Steve sent them out to the RAB, and they, they also come to me at that point as a final document, and then I place them on the MPART website. In the past, there's been some comments that haven't been incorporated, so I've just highlighted that on the version that we placed on the MPART website. David, does that address the question you had? Yes, it does. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And Sarah, do we have other uh, RAB member questions virtually? Okay. All right. So RAB member questions, just an opportunity for discussion among the RAB members. Uh, I see Arnie has a question. Go ahead. Arnie. A follow-up question to, uh, to Beth and, and Steve. Will the BCTs still include, you mentioned you're going to move more to a topic technical topic uh, based meeting, but will the BCTs still include status of the circular process items uh, of documents and the movement of the different stages of production of the document by the contractor, you guys approve the Air Force, and then it moves to uh, review by Eagle and so forth. We, we do not intend to go through them in that level of detail. It'll really be highlighting key documents that um, either we're preparing and giving Eagle a heads up that they're coming, or if a document's in Eagle's hands, letting them know that it's critical to the process and we need their comments. Um, but just keeping each other informed on, on key documents, not necessarily every single document and where it is in the process, but we do have tracking sheets Right. For documents and for action items that we send out on a regular basis to keep each agency informed of what's going on so that we don't spend two hours in a meeting going through item by item by item. Exactly. Uh, but those were not shared with us uh, three or four years ago when I asked for them. But then every once in a while, 
maybe once or twice a year, it would show up attached that sh tracking sheet uh, to the BCTs. And that was so helpful for us to keep up with what documents are going through your process so we can focus our reviews and understanding. So I would hope that you will include those as an attachment. So right now they're not being tracked as a BCT, but instead I've got Andrea looking at those and tracking them for us and then setting them up as wrap updates so that they're highlighted as where each document is in the process. So I think we've been sending those out every other month. We could probably send them out more regularly if you wanted to. Yeah, we can send those out monthly. <clears throat> I don't want to add work, I just it, attach it so it's together, so there's a copy in the IR, there's a copy that's sent out to the RAB members so that we're staying abreast of the work that you're doing. I think it'll help a the lot. The problem with what was happening was we were spending hours just going over documents that we could have looked at in five minutes and right. gone, we know where we're at and we know where our hot items are. So we weren't doing anything technical during the BCTs. It's time to get the BCTs back to decision making no. sessions, not document review. Where are I agree. We? Steve, did you have a comment you want to add? I was just going to say we, we can send that out monthly to the to the RAB members. Um, it's not something that goes in the admin record because it's really not a document that we use to make decisions. It's more just of a status document. But yeah, it's, it's, it's something we're already updating regularly anyways. Right. So sending it to the RAB members is no problem. So we, have, we can continue to do that. And Beth, place anything you'd like to add? Um, just Eagle was supportive of the change in the minutes. Then, you know, we're receiving the trackers. Um, Steve and Catherine and I have started to meet, um, you know, weekly again, schedule permitting. So we'll miss one or two here and there. But I to help you know, keep on track for those. But we're, Eagle is very uh, supportive of the more technical form of the meetings and decision making. Great, thank you. Okay, yes, I'm coming. Hi, uh, Dr. Varley, I'd like to reopen the question from earlier regarding the storm sewer. The question was, well, you, your answer, I should say, was that you were putting together a plan and that it was up for, for getting approval. Um, I guess my question here is, is what is the plan? Because uh, we as a township, I'm not in that meeting with you, but I guess once a month, third Wednesday of each month, uh, you meet with uh, the superintendent, Bill Palmer, and possibly others from the township. And we haven't had a meeting with you in a couple of months, but um, what is the plan that's being proposed? Um, and that's my first question. I have a follow on after that. The plan is to line the infrastructure. So we have been talking with the township for, hold on. Can you guys hear me better now? Yes. Let's just take this off. All right, <laughs> sorry about that. All right, so we've been talking with the township for the last year, working through the logistics, getting the money lined up, making sure that we have a path forward. We have done our cost analysis, looking at what it would take if we were to put our own line in versus a partnership with the township. We have shown our management what it would take it has gone up to leadership and we expect a good path forward where we're collaborating and we're moving forward together um, this also goes forward for as we talk about stormwater and the ri and making sure that we have a comprehensive look at all the different places that stormwater is going and as we move forward just as a whole to make sure we understand our delineation of these plumes and where we can actually take action as soon as possible. Okay, good. So in this plan, uh, does this mean that you're going to be proposing taking over as the Air Force, the ownership of the storm sewer system in order to do the slip lining? No, we're going to pay the township to do the lining. You pay them to do it. We're oh. going to give them the funding so that they it. can get the contractor to do the work. Okay, got it. That is what we have talked with both Tammy and Ann about. Okay, good. That wasn't clear okay. with them because they're asking me. So the next topic here is then some years ago when we had the central system installed, uh, we sent as an agreement, we were charging the Air Force for the storm sewer and several invoices were paid for the use of the storm sewer for the, for the water that is filtered and then released from the system, goes into Lake Huron. 
So since then, and it's been some years now, we have no longer been paid for the storm and sewer in Central. Uh, when the Mission Street system was put online, all of that, all those payments stopped. So the question here is, what is the plan for this? Um, if you're not assuming responsibility for the ownership of the system, but you're going to pay us for that, is that in, in are you looking for something, Dr. Barrow? Oh, I've got phone a friend going on right now. <laughs> I like phone a friend. My whole entire team will help me respond to your questions. So I see. It, Go ahead. it always works this way. So. Go ahead. Yeah. So what we're talking about is a ready to serve fee and a slip lining right. of the problem area, the area where the our breaks and okay. roots get in. All right. And yes, the goal is to pay a responsible party a ready to serve fee. Got it. And we've got to be careful with language because the language that is used brings down different restrictions that we shouldn't be talking about in the first place because we're not talking about stormwater. We're talking about infrastructure. We're talking about oh, utilities. Right. We're talking about moving treated water down That's a right. system. That's right. In a system that frankly was built decades ago and not meant nearly for the volume that you're using it for, which is part of the reason why we've been concerned about this. So good, yes, clarification of terms is important. And I still do not see it as the final remedy. So just to be clear, good. we are moving towards the final remedy and at the pace we're going, I'd like to see a final remedy getting implemented around 2025. So as, if we keep pace. As final remedy, what do you envision that to look like? So we It's going to be based on our findings, but honestly, if you look at FTO2 and how we're using the infiltration there, we could use infiltration to get better capture. We could use infiltration to actually make sure that we are recirculating and cleaning out the, the ground, the groundwater, and not having a continuous source that's bypassing any of our systems. Just a note to Rex Bond, we see your hand up and we'll come to you here in just a moment. But uh, thank you. Comments, any further thank questions? You. I'm good. I'm okay. so just letting her answer the question. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, good. Uh, let's turn to Rex Bond with a question. I'm looking for a clarification from Catherine. Uh, you, you pronounced the word relining quicker than I could process it, but are you talking about a polymer liner inside the existing drain? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. That was my only question because that's uh, a way to extend life of an existing structure and not have to replace it. Is that correct? Yes, sir. The other complication that we've come across is that there's a garage over the top of part of the line that's broken. So we have to think about the infrastructure that is there and how to best repair it, right? Or make it so that we're not the best solution for the area and the situation. Okay. Is that a garage on private property? Yes, sir. Why don't you just buy it? What? <laughs> buy it, knock it down. We can't do that. We're trying to we're trying to turn over land. I'm working with the airport right now to turn over land. Well, then buy it and give it to them for a dollar. But I, but, but you've answered my <laughs> question, thank you. Okay, thanks Rex. And to Arnie Larich. Uh, the storm sewer is that the whole conversation for the last three years has been about reimbursement for use and things like that. And you mentioned tonight that it's mostly or it is a conveyance of the treated water from your pump and treat systems. In addition to that, it is also a storm sewer. It's receiving storm water off roofs of buildings and things like that on the base. There are sections where it could be picking up occasionally with rain events, actual groundwater, contaminated groundwater, potentially. And so, well, the 8th Street floods. So anyways, my point is this, does the RI work plan include a sampling and analysis of any potential contributions of PFAS coming through, collected by and coming through the storm sewer. Because I've seen that analysis as an RI item in other bases, other RI studies going on right now. To look at the clean water that we're discharging, is that what you're talking about? No, potentially contaminated water 
From where? Anywhere. I don't want to get into the details, but. I'm confused right now, Arnie. I can show you a couple of bases where their RI includes those analysis. Peterson, Air Force Base, is one that comes to mind. So, so there's an example that you could take a look at and see if there's an application. We are. That should be done here. Friend a friend. <laughs> we are helping. Sorry, I've got multiple coming in at once. We are helping the airport with their understanding of stormwater as they've replied to Eagle, and we are going to continue that as well as with the township. Um, yeah, so we are we are working with our partners to address yeah, stormwater. Because pretreatment kind true. of raises its ugly head too on connections from anything that's on the base. But this would be the time to address that as yep. you're helping other the, the airport. And yeah, the we're doing a comprehensive and that meeting got canceled this week. Sorry, I wasn't understand where you're going with it. But um, yeah, we are meeting with the airport and the township to come up with a comprehensive understanding of what the stormwater looks like. But okay. is it an item in the RI? Yes, correct, okay. sir. That's part of, yes. And when will we see that? With the work plan? As soon, well, I don't know how much details in the work plan, but that will be coming out as soon as the township and the Air Force and the airport meet and come up mm -hmm. with the overall comprehensive plan. We have met with the airport. Um, they were provided a non-compliance that's been involved as well. And we came up with where we were going to start sampling. But we need to look at it as a holistic versus a single round, just a single spot. Let me turn back. I see you have a, a follow-up well, question, and then I'll. Well, turn the RI. Right. Let me let me just jump in oh, and make sure. sure that we're we're all speaking one at a time. We could go ahead, Arnie. Uh, I mean, the RI is the heart of the circle of programs to move to the next step of feasibility. And we've got some other things going on. The township is doing studies the last couple of years. Excuse me, let me finish. With the state on the wastewater treatment plan and other things, you've got work that you're doing with the airport on and including the stormwater and so forth. But that's all well and good. I'm glad it's happening. However, it's wherever it applies to a potential contamination source, it needs to be into in the RI. And I'm a little surprised that it's not already we, an action, an item in the plan. We are, the look, Dr. we are looking at it with the RI. So, and we are doing it comprehensively with our partners, the township, the forest service and the airport. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, actually, Mark Henry had a hand up, and then Beth, I'll, I'll turn to you. Go ahead, Mark. Well, I was going to put a little more specificity to Arnie's question. Uh, the stormwater sewer that discharges to Three Pipes Ditch uh, is uh, coming from the airport direction, and that outfall contains PFAS above Rule 57 numbers to the best of my knowledge. And it's coming out of a storm sewer. And to paraphrase Arnie's question, is an effort going to be made to find where the groundwater that or whatever source is providing that PFAS to the storm sewer is determined during the RI and potentially stopped as part of the remedial action? The answer is yes. I've gotten many different types of yes, but the answer is yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mark. And to Beth, please. Yeah, so I just wanted to mention that Air Force is working with our, um, with OA and our Emerging Contaminants Unit from the Water Resources Division. I've been involved in some of those discussions to sample stormwater outfalls. Um, in addition to that, Eagle does have comments um, for Air Force to have a comprehensive look at the stormwater uh, inputs to PFAS contamination during the remedial investigation. So that is included in the Eagle comments. Okay. Thank you. 
And so, so just yes, that's something, Catherine. I think what you're doing is you're receiving input from, from other your team. Yes, my and team. Will and that's great. Help. I'm glad it's happening. I don't want to expect that you to have all, all the answers. Um, However, it would be very helpful, such as in the meetings that we used to have, that your contractors stand up and we know who's talking. We know if there's a follow up later on who Arnie? is answering these things. Because this happened at the last meeting in this room. And so part of this is that our team, a lot of people were taken out by COVID in the last last couple of weeks. They were not allowed to travel. They are texting me That's instead right. of talking. I would rather them save their voices, save their energy, provide me what they can. Perfect. All I'm su suggesting oh. is it possible that those people be added to the attendees list and that when you receive something, just say, I just received this from XYZ and this is what the answer is we are one team we will function as one team i'm getting it from everybody all at the same time so mark watched it come in i got four different responses all at the same time of yes we will function as one team thank you mm -hmm. thanks Martin. other questions from the rad members yes sir Martin. <clears throat> i have a, a question that was submitted to me by joe maxwell who's not here today and as a background to his question, uh, let me uh, state that um, a few years ago, I'm guessing six, seven years ago, eight years ago, uh, DEQ at the time did a study on Wordsmith Air Force Base and found where water that had been in the uh, water distribution system on the base had been isolated for some reason, shut off. And the state went in and sampled that water within uh, water supply lines from fire hydrants, uh, hot water heaters from buildings that were no longer being used, et cetera, and found relatively high levels of PFAS in those samples. And the, if it is true that the PFAS was in the water distribution system and that water distribution system serviced uh, not only the, uh, the uh, workers on the base, but also the families on the base in the housing area, it is very likely that there was some exposure to PFAS. So Joe Maxwell's question is, is the USAF going to wait to test the veterans and employees who served here? Um, wait a minute. Is the, is the Air Force going to wait to test the veterans and employees who served here but wait until they are all dead to finally run blood tests on them to find out if they were exposed to PFAS while they were living here. Okay, so first things first, we are in charge of cleanup, we do not do health. But that being said, we are the representatives of the Air Force here on site, right? I have looked at that report. That report is a single report that has some data in it, does not show the modeling or the time frames of when that was fully turned off. We do know that the wells were abandoned around, I believe it was 1993 or something along those lines. And from that, um, there was no data taken for PFAS before that actually happened. So we didn't know that PFAS was an issue before those drinking water wells were decommissioned. We also know that it wasn't every single fire hydrant that actually was hot. So we don't know what people could have actually been drinking. If the data doesn't exist, I don't know how to analyze it. I looked at it myself as well, and I have a health background. I understand, but there is, uh, that report is highly suggestive that there was PFAS in the water distribution system. And the question that Joe is asking is, the Air Force going to be looking at service members and employees who were potentially, and families who were potentially exposed to those chemicals in the water distribution system in a sooner than later scenario because people are getting older and people are dying. So again, we do clean up. I get that. The color of money we work with is cleanup money. It is not health. We depend on ATSDR 
and we depend on DHHS and DHHS to provide the health, right? Who's going to do the detective work? Kathy, can you help me out here? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to add to the comments that Mark is saying that, um, and also include that um, some of us on the RAB are meeting with Secretary Kidd on a quarterly basis and presenting questions to him, uh, um, one of which uh, was about the exposure to veterans and their families um, on, on this site. Um, and he indicated the same answer you did, which is there's no data to support that those families were exposed to PFAS in the, in the wells that were um, created here in 1985 and were used through 1993. The comment and just the suggestion that there was no PFAS in those huge plumes that those wells were placed on is utterly rid ridiculous, and I believe that the community members that, that lived here at the time think the same thing. So let's go from a technical standpoint, right? I, I, I don't want to argue, argue science on it because me, it's it's just, I just don't want to argue that. It's, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead and finish any comments. Um, okay. But we do have the opportunity to ask the Department of Defense these questions. Um, and I want to address the, the blood sampling or the, you know, health monitoring. Um, we didn't we didn't receive a report on this. It, it, it is in the works. It's an exposure assessment through the state of Michigan that people who live in Ascoda um, will be able to participate in. It will be starting um, in the spring, summer of this year, going through the end of the year, and it will include blood sampling, um, uh, exposure uh, questionnaire um, in terms of PFAS exposure and uh, possible water sampling. So. Um, that will be an opportunity for veterans that have ever been here or been here since um, 2012 um, and have visited Ascoda in the last 10 years. So yeah, that, uh, again, is not a RAB responsibility, but it does address maybe Joe's question. I didn't hear the organization that would be doing that. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, Michigan, right. Michigan. Mm -hmm. okay. the right. state of Michigan. Okay. Great. Um, so let me just uh, check Tim. in with Puneet Vidge and, and see, Puneet, if you have anything that you'd like to share on this. Uh, so yes, as Kathy mentioned, uh, there's going to be an exposure assessment uh, starting uh, this year in summer. And uh, uh, depending on the eligibility criteria, if uh, like anyone who had, who ate fish, deer, or wildlife, like uh, after, after 2012 they will be eligible this uh, exposure assessment is still in the planning and development phase right now there will be uh, updates that's why regularly we meet our community advisory team and kathy is a part of that so um, yeah there, there will be a blood draw as well as there will be uh, water sampling Okay, thank you, Panita. And you know, one of the, the beneficial aspects of these restoration advisory boards, even though the focus is on environmental restoration, it draws in organizations with lots of different competencies. And so when questions come up that may not be, you know, ones that, that get resolved in a restoration advisory board, we, at least we can direct them to the proper agency. Um, Mark, I know you started that question on, on, on uh, behalf of others, but let me just turn back to you to see if there's further, further questions that come to mind, further discussion that you feel like you should have. Um, I wanted to raise the issue. Um, that's why I provided a little background to Joe's question. Right. Um, but um, I think that this needs to be um, discussed on a higher level. Um, I think that the Air Force really needs to do uh, detective work in the RI. Uh, to find out if there was human exposure um, at this base and at other bases that are going to be looked at. Um, uh, the state found some creative ways to find water that had been uh, encapsulated in areas uh, that was left over from base operations. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that could be done at a lot of BRAC bases. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Barley, any response? Or? I'm still trying to figure out how. How would we do that and how would that help with cleanup? It won't help with cleanup at all. It will help understanding if service members and their families had been exposed to PFAS while they were living on the base. I'm still trying to figure out how do you track something that 
was only used during a specific time frame when you don't have the data to model it. And I'm thinking about it from a military's perspective, right? Mm -hmm. So military members, and even some of us GS members, every three years or so, we get a new assignment, we move to a new base. How do you know that the exposure was from a specific location during a specific point in time? Well, for, uh, for uh, transitory military people, it becomes more difficult, granted. But there were civilian workers who worked on the base for their careers working on their base for 20, 25 years of their career as civilians working for the U.S. government. And those people were at Wordsmith. And a few of those people are still around. And it's an opportunity to find out what kind of exposure they had while they were working on the base. And I assume that all this was taken to ATSDR already. Um, I haven't brought it to them, have you? I asked ATSDR to uh, take a look at Wordsmith Air Force Base, the people that worked here and the military families that were here about uh, two years ago, and they said they'd get back with me, and they haven't. And ATSDR is the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. And they work very close with DHHS. So DHHS, do you have any other thoughts on this? Any? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Do you have any other thoughts? I mean, when I start thinking about this and how military works and how people move, I just don't understand how the data will be used or how you can tell what the sources really truly are and then how that helps us progress. No, I agree with you. It's like, uh, okay, you the maybe the exposure would have happened but without any knowledge about the concentrations and uh you know and from that particular time uh any decision will be not certain enough like you know you so we don't have the data from 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 that time so i think that's what i i'm going to add that's it and I'll, I'll come to Arne in just one moment. Uh, Puneet, um, I, I wonder if you might, you mentioned some exposure assessment activities, if you might be able to provide that information to myself or the co-chairs uh, for that to be uh, communicated as well. Arne, we'll go to you. Arne. Sure. Well, well, first off, um, Catherine, you, you've sort of said that it's not remediation and that's what the Air Force is here for. And from my knowledge of Circle, you're correct. Because the Air Force now says there is no current exposure through drinking water coming from the base. It's debatable a little bit, maybe on the east side, Bennett Lake, but generally you're right, because there's no municipal water coming from groundwater on the base. So therefore the process is, and we went through this and I helped some of the, vet, the veterans group in 2017, 18, that the Department of Health and Human Services can submit a request to ATSDR and request a health assessment be done. It was done back then in the summer of 2018. The veterans submitted a letter to the ATSDR and they did a health assessment for TCE and the VOCs. They completed that a year and a half later. And that's the same kind of study that the Camp Lejeune used for Congress to authorize a special medical monitoring and help to the vets and so forth. That has not happened. I don't know if Jake is still here. Okay. Um, there was a bill that Kildy submitted two years ago. It didn't move forward. Um, and now there's one being developed for PFAS. Uh, so that is the process for that. And as long as there's no pathway for drinking water exposing anyone in Oscoda or Sable in an area, 
uh, then the Air Force is not really involved, except for maybe helping with records, which vets were here and so forth if they go that route. So I think that's the answer on that. But I think the Department of Health, in, in fairness to the vets, because I know a number of them firsthand and I've worked with them four years ago on doing this, they deserve better than that they've been receiving. And so that definitely a topic, and I would suggest you add it as a, an AI as action item that you're going to pass on to the Department of Health to move it that way. That's what I would suggest. Hey, Panit. So Arnie wants to make a health AI action item. Is that something that you're willing to chair, that you're willing to take? If it's related to the same question, so as ATSDR also mentioned, you know, it, without sufficient information, it, it, it's, it's not possible to determine uh, if uh, there was an exposure in the past. It may have happened, but without data. Um, Okay, well, let me let me move to Kathy Worcesterbarth. You've been very patient, Kathy. Go yep, ahead. I'm wondering if we could allow Jake Bennett to address this a little bit for us. He, I think he has some history that he could share. Would you be willing to come up, Jake? Yeah. Oh, come to the mic. Come to the mic. Mike, if you don't mind. <laughs> we need congressional help. Sorry, you know, I'm kind of bouncing in my seat here because I wanted to say something. Is the mic on still? It is. Okay. This is uh, Jake Bennett. Yes, Jake Bennett, Congressman Dan Kildee's office. Uh, uh, a couple of things. So uh, we obviously, we've been working on this. I've worked on VA casework for almost 20 years, and I know it's very difficult for people, for veterans specifically, to connect all the dots. You have to say, uh, how much were you exposed to at that level? Does this health condition happen? Do you have this health condition? Uh, a lot of other things like that. And that's why it's so difficult to connect all the dots. What they're looking at is, um, um, it, were, the, were they exposed to it? So for also being a firefighter, I'm very familiar with the fire hydrants. Now with the hydrants, the ones that, the, the dry barrel ones that we have right now, typically they have uh, uh, holes in the bottom of it to allow them to drain. Unfortunately, a lot of those holes get clogged, so the water is not allowed to come out. And that's why in a lot of these fire hydrants, they're at the PFAS is at different levels because some of them have been able to be flushed and go out. Some of them have not been able to be flushed. So that's why they're seeing some of the varying numbers. So the reason why the congressman introduced the, the VET PFAS bill is because like Agent Orange, it's so hard to prove at what level you were exposed, how long ago, though. So with that bill, it created a presumption and the congressman essentially modeled it after the, the Agent Orange one to say, if you were exposed, we're going to presume, and if you're exposed, and we know from the C8 study, a lot of these health conditions are the result of exposure to PFAS, then we're going to presume that that's because of that exposure from the Department of Defense. So a lot of the things like with, with other conditions, uh, we, we have good knowledge through the C8 study that a lot of these health conditions are reoccurring in somebody who has been exposed to a lot of PFAS. So uh, that's why it's difficult, but what I think they're getting at is uh, the VA has a, what's called a duty to assist when somebody files a VA claim. It's the VA's responsibility to gather as much information for that veteran for their claim as possible. So what they're looking at where the Air Force and the DOD can help out with is getting as much uh, information as they can about what those prior exposures are. So it, that's why it's so tough right now for these veterans to get claims for PFAS exposure is because they didn't know to look for it back then to get this information. So that's that's kind of what, what the problem is, what the veterans problem is. So any additional information we can try to get, uh, even if it's modeling, because we know the plumes were in the area where this water was being drawn out for the base. So we know right now from the mappings, the plume, we know the plume is from a specific uh, plane crash that happened. We know when that plane crash happened. We know that the foam was put on there. We know this plume is because of that. So we can, uh, probably confidently say that the PFAS in the plume where the wall was being pulled up for the water to, to uh, put for the base, we know that probably had PFAS. So any of this data, this background information you guys can provide, it can help the VA in their duty to assist for these people's claims 
But obviously, separate from that, we're trying to work on the vet PFAS build that will just presume that if you're exposed to it, then you have this, this condition, it's because of your exposure for PFAS. I hope that kind of fills in some of the gaps here. Thank you for that summary, sir. All right, thanks. All right, okay, well, so I do just wanna be cognizant of the time we have, and I know this important topic will be what we start off our public comment period with as well. Uh, before we move into the public comment period, let me just see if there are further rap number questions. Just one quick point so that we don't further confuse things. The response that the Air Force made to someone who requested on what is the Air Force doing about and use, are they using that study? And the answer that came back said the Air Force doesn't know anything about it. I did quick research because I knew. Bob Delaney presented the capture zone, which was a modeling report, and the hydrant data to the RAB on August 30th of 2018. That's a month after that report was finalized. So it's on our record for the RAB. You did not have the ability to know that fact, but someone who was, whoever was involved in answering that response, making that response, did not do their homework. And we need to do a little bit better job. So what I'm getting from my team is that based off of our knowledge and what we've looked at, we did not know that the plumes were there that during the that time frame, that the plumes were actually, in fact, there at that time frame in those. Well, there was a flaw in the Dr. Barley's study. Comment. Go ahead, Dr. Barley. So I'm just going to read it. We did not know the plumes were there when the wells were used. There was a flaw in Eagle's capture study. Um, no, that was not a response that was said from our group. Okay, again, we do have a veterans group that will be leading off the public comment period, I think on, on the same topic. Um, before we move into the public comment period, just want to see if there are further RAD member questions. Mark Henry, one of my own. Yes, <laughs> go ahead. Um, I came into this meeting at, with the uh, hope that uh, someone from the Air Force would explain to the RAB the changes in the conceptual site model that have been made since the beginning of the RI. The RI appears to be a third, maybe a half done, and the conceptual site model is a dynamic thing. And so I was hoping that someone could give us an update on how the conceptual site model has changed, either at this meeting, uh, which would be good, but perhaps a more um, formal presentation at the next RAB meeting. So and that in future RAB meetings, that this topic is recurring. How is the Air Force's understanding of what's going on evolving during the course of the RI? So this is something that I did want to actually touch on. However, Colin Plank, who is actually doing a lot of our modeling for us, was not able to be here due to other complications. So we will have it at another meeting okay. because I need the right people at the sure. right time. Okay. Well, thank you. And let me just check in. Uh, it looks like no hands up from the RAD members who have joined in virtually. Uh, last call for any RAD members' questions. Yes, Beth, please. So during that discussion on um, current um, groundwater being consumed, so uh, residential wells, Eagle just wondered if Air Force would be revising their um, residential well survey during the remedial investigation. Since the plume is expanding, um, we would want to make sure that um, Air Force understands what residential wells may be impacted. If it's not under contract at this point in time, but it's something that we continue to talk about. Okay. Thank you, Beth. Okay, well, so let's move into the public comment period and continue uh, this discussion if we could. So slide uh, 21 provides some uh, guidelines for our public comment period. Again, uh, these RAB, RAB meetings are essentially in two parts. One is conversation among the RAB members, and then the second part, which we're now entering, is uh, conversation uh, from other public members, uh, attendees, either in person or virtual. So we're now in that public uh, comment portion of the meeting. 
and um, opening the floor to members of the public who are not RAD members to uh, share comments they, they have, concerns they have. Um, again, those of you who are in person, if you would like to make a, a comment, then you can come down to the microphone here. Um, if you are joined um, virtually by computer, you can raise your hand electronically. If you're on the phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand and star nine to lower it again. Again, star six to mute and unmute yourself. Um, let's go ahead and move to uh, slide 22, if we could. And uh, we have a, a lead off comment by the Veterans and Civilians Clean Water Alliance. I wanted to turn to Senior Airman James Bussey, um, if we could ensure that uh, the number ending 7884 is unmuted. And Senior Airman, uh, please go ahead and speak if you're able to. Hello, I'm uh, James Bussey. I served at Works with Air Force Base from 1989 and 1992. Uh, to hear the recent news that the Air Force denied documentation that uh, we were exposed to high levels of PFOS is really just another slap in the face, not only to veterans, but our dependents and the people of Oscoda. And as far as being tested for PFOS, I was sent to a special VA in 2017 uh, at, after multiple requests to then Secretary Shokin, uh, I was sent to a risk center, which are only three, and was tested for five different PFOS compounds, all of which returned in phenomenal numbers. Uh, and I will authorize Kathy Westerbar to release those test records because she has access to my group files. And also Jake Bennett has access to those group files. And the VA contamination specialist, Dr. Osanubi, uh, forgive me if I don't remember her first name, concluded that the only way I could have been exposed to such high numbers was from my service at Warsmith. Um, so I'm your test subject, and you know anybody who wants to talk to me, I am more than willing to you know share with you any information you would like. Uh, and, and really, and I'm imploring you to, you know, take quicker action for the citizens of Oscoda. I mean, we, we best, you know, hear the motto, deny, deny, deny till you die. And unfortunately, that's really happening quite a bit. I run a group called Veterans and Civilians Clean Water Alliance, which is based on Worsmith Air Force Base. And... Daily, I get dozens of messages from veterans. James, I'm, I'm, I'm dying. I, I have cancer. We did a, we did a health uh, poll. Worse with veterans and their dependents suffer from exotic cancers and other diseases at a unbelievably higher rate than the national norm. And to have the Department of the Air Force deny this is just absurd. And really, that is all I have to say. And actually, Arnie, actually, there is one other thing. I'm the one that had the ATSDR uh, health assessment reopened. Uh, they would only do it for the volatile organic chemicals. Uh, they declined to do it for PFOS, which reasons were already explained. But unfortunately, when, when, when are we going to be able to see help for the town? I mean, we keep hearing, we need to study this. We need to study this more. You can study it to death, folks. You cause the problem, and it's up to you to fix it. And that's all I have to say. Well, thank you very much for your comments, sir. We appreciate those. And you mentioned Kathy Wisterbroth. Kathy, let me just see if there's anything that you'd like to add. No, he was just referencing his health, his health records that, yeah, we certainly can submit to the Air Force. Um, via this rabbit, that's something that they would find interesting. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Um, let me just check to see if there are other representatives of the Veterans and Civilians Clean Water Alliance that also would like to speak. Okay, I know uh, Mr. Tony Spaniola um, had signed up to make a public comment, so Mr. Spaniola, we'll turn to you for your three minute comment, sir. Thank you, can you hear me? Um, yes, sir. Can you try that one more time? You were a little bit low. Okay. Is this better? It's a bit better. Let me ask uh, AV folks if they can adjust 
that so that we can hear it a bit more. Try one more time, Tony, please. Okay, how about now? Okay, I think that works. Yes, sir, go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. There are a number of things I wanna talk about, uh, not the least of which is this, uh, the, the issue with the veterans and their families. But uh, just a couple of things first. Uh, in a recent meeting uh, that we had with uh, some officials at the Pentagon, I was personally assured that uh, there is sufficient funding to accomplish everything that needs to be done at Wordsmith. Uh, and if that were not the case, uh, that uh, I were to report to that person at the Pentagon to let them know and that uh, that would be straightened out. So uh, if any funding, if there are any funding issues um, within the Air Force uh, on this cleanup, I would ask uh, that that be related to me or, or to now and we will follow up. Um, secondly, uh, the remedial investigation process, the fact that it's being done in secret is not acceptable. Um, I'm hoping that, that uh, something can be done to fix that. I know that uh, it, in other situations, at other bases in the country, it has happened that there has been ongoing involvement and back and forth between the community members and the Air Force while the, the RI was in the development. And I hope that that's something that can happen here quickly. With regard to the BCT meetings, People should, from the community should be allowed in, period. And as a backup to that, we have a court reporter here tonight transcribing everything, all this back and forth with minutes and reviews and back and forth, bring a court reporter to the meeting, transcribe the meeting and, and issue the, the transcription right away. Delays are not acceptable. Now with regard to the, 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 the veterans at Wordsmith and their families, the treatment that they are receiving is unconscionable. In the military, it's supposed to be soldiers first. What we're hearing is that it's soldiers last, if ever. <clears throat> the Department of Defense issued a statement in response to a public engagement se uh, session question, denying that any knowledge of any data that would show high levels of contamination in the drinking water. The scientist from the Department of Environmental Quality who conducted the investigations, including the reports that were provided, has called that a flat out lie. That's not, those aren't my words, those are his. And the Department of Defense had the opportunity to correct that in, after being interviewed by a news reporter from MY. The Department of Defense doubled down and continued to say, we don't know anything about this. And I'm gonna read a quote from the scientist, Bob Delaney. Even if we had never produced any data, it's ridiculous. Anybody going to that base, knowing the history of PFAS, knowing the groundwater flow, knowing how this stuff travels, would know that people were drinking this stuff at high levels. This is not rocket science. This is basic 101 environmental geology. Now, the Air Force should not be punting this issue to DHHS. It's the Air Force's responsibility to take care of the people who have served our country and to kick them under the bus and to continue to, to, to kick the can down the road on this is just totally unacceptable. Our community can't stand for this. And this is not the end of this issue, I promise you. Dr. Varley, I ask that you talk to your superiors and figure out a way to help these people. That's what we're supposed to be here to do. They put their lives on the line for us. This is not a time to be sweeping them under the rug. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spaniola. All right, Tony, I'd like to take a second just to talk to everything that you said, at least in overview. So the big thing comes down to how we look at data and what data we have available. We try to make data-driven decisions and we work with ATSDR and DHHS to make those decisions. Kathy, I ask that you provide the records to DHHS so that they may share them with ATSDR and decide any appropriate paths forward. Um, and we will do our due diligence to continue to work to make cleanup efforts because that is our job and that is what we are tasked with. We will do what we can to contain, capture, remove source areas as fast as we possibly can. Yeah, this is James Bussey. I have another question. Or I have another question with a statement. Okay, uh, Mr. Bussey, or 
I'm sorry, go ahead and uh, make a comment. You have three minutes, sir. Okay, uh, real quick here. Like I said, I'm your test subject. The VA determined after 200 emails to Secretary Shulkin, someone finally called me. They determined that it could only have come from Wordsmith. So, again, you know, please take my health records, my exposure records to your superiors because there's your answer. And I was only there for three years. So what about the people that have been there longer? What about the dependents that grew up there? Um, again, to have the Department of the Air Force deny this is just, it's unacceptable. Uh, you know, veterans are, are dying every day. Dependents are dying every day. And unfortunately, we're, we're not being taken care of by the VA. It's taken me 10 years to get where I am of constantly fighting. Uh, and I'm, I, I'm just upset that the Air Force is continuing to say we don't know about any documentation. Well, again, here I am. Senior Airman Bussey, thank you very much for, for those comments and also for providing that information. Um, and it sounds like um, your suggestion, Dr. Barley, was that that information be provided to MDHHS for the possible consideration of conveying to the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. Correct. Our job is clean up. Their job is health. We need to move forward in this together. And the best way to do it is to get the health agencies doing the health, and we will do what we can to support what we can. Um, a lot more goes into it than just the three years at Wordsmith. It's what was your career, what was your exposure, what was your diet like? There's a lot more that the health agency would need to get into. So, and that's not our job as cleanup. I believe we also have a, uh, a comment or a response from Dr. Stephen Termath. So Dr. Termath, we'll turn to you. Sir. Yes, thank you very much. I just want to try and clarify a few things here. That first of all, the Department of the Air Force does care very much about those who have served and served well on there. And we recognize that and we do it. The part of the Air Force that you're dealing with tonight can only speak to what we have in front of us. And I think it's important to note that I realize Mr. Delaney has uh, thrown dispersions on the Air Force, but uh, with regard to that, but the very study that his data was in, DEQ concluded that there is no way to know the concentration or the duration of that was in the, the water. And that's been the problem for the health agencies to now try and figure out that. The Department of the Air Force and knowing where the wells were and everything acknowledges that it's extremely likely and, and probable that there were exposures by those who were either assigned or civilians that worked on there, but it's not known what concentrations were needed. And so we're exposed. And so, and if you also look at that report, there were something like 22 samples taken, if whether they're hydrants or whatever, 7,000 was the highest, but over half of those samples that were taken were below the EPA health advisory level. So those are some of the things that, that came into play in reaching that. We don't, from a health perspective, the Department of Air Force is not analyzing the acceptability or anything else of the data. We provide that data and the health agencies are doing their best to figure it out. Let's face it, we've got EPA, we've got the, the Agency of uh, Toxic Substances and Disease Registry working on it and the VA, others are all trying to figure out what does the science tell them that it is. I, I recognize there's uh, some empirical data that have been presented here tonight that says more uh, that it exceeds the rate of uh, cancers compared to the normal population, all those things on there. So I, I apologize that we're not able to address the health issues. I don't apologize as much as I say we're unable to address those. And, and you know, and Mr. Kidd's office is working very diligently with the other agencies to try and get 
any information they can give us that would be useful in, in how we address the cleanup activities that we do. And sorry for the interruption on that, but I did want to help give those uh, clarifications. Thank you, Dr. Termath. We appreciate that input. Let me just check to see if there are other public comments to be made. Um, again, if you're here in person and would like to make a public comment, please come up to the microphone. If you've uh, connected electronically, please just raise your hand electronically. If you're on the phone, please press star nine and that will raise your hand. We have a comment. If you would like to, would you share your name and, and then make sure. a three minute comment? Um, my name's Heather Smith. I actually was born right here on Wordsmith Air Force Base. Um, as far as the house stuff, I get it, you guys. It's the cleanup thing. At the same time, I do want to say that I was born on the base. I lived on the base for, for nine years. My dad pretty much stabilized here. Um, when the base closed down, he went to New York for a year and a half. Um, until he retired, we stayed here. So there are some of us that have that exposure that's really just here. Um, if you saw where I live, which is off of Colbath, you could argue that, <laughs> that I've been exposed since. But I do have a sibling that was quick to get out of this town. You know, when she turned 18, 19, she was out of here. So this was her primary residence as well. She's had no exposure anywhere else. Um, I just wanted to kind of throw that out there that we're, we're here. There are some of us that are here. Um, that this is our only place. You know, I, I left here, I joined the military myself. I left for 10 years, I came back. Um, and then, so that's all I really have to say on that. We're out here, <laughs> we really are. Um, and I wanted to comment on the access agreements. Being someone that lives like off of Indian Trail, right off of Colbath, most of the people out there that I have interactions with, um, are summer people. So if you're sending out those letters for those agreements during the fall and winter months, there's a good chance that they're not gonna respond because they're not permanent residents here. Um, also, I know like there's a sportsman's club um, that has lake access right there. Um, there are, there's cabins, there's also a public access. Are we looking at those things to be able to put um, testing wells out there. So um, I think the target population, especially in my area too, there's not very many of us that are permanent residents back there. Most of them are rentals. So I think taking into account that when you're looking into our areas that are contaminated, you know, how many rentals are back there? How many of them are permanent? Um, and then making sure you're targeting the right people um, if they're seasonal, then we have to make sure we're reaching out downstate to those people that live down there. Thank you very much for your comment. Ms. Thank Smith. you, Heather. And thanks for uh, just the emphasis that this is not a conceptual or hypothetical discussion. This is real life, right? Yeah. Are there other public comments to be made in person, virtually, over the phone, or? There's some as of yet undeveloped method. Anything else to share? Okay. Well, so we have gone through the full agenda that we had in front of us and uh, co-chairs, I think we're at the conclusion and adjournment uh, portion of the meeting, but just want to turn to you both for any closing comments you have. Uh, Mark, would you like to start off? And I'll turn to Dr. Varley. I'd just like to thank everybody for participating in this that was able to. And um, I hate to see Dr. Varley go. <laughs> I'd like to thank everybody that's part of this team. The team really does extend beyond the people that are with the Air Force, beyond the people that are at these tables. It's everybody that's working together every day to make progress. And progress will continue. Thank you all. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Um, we are adjourned, and thank you for your participation. Have a good night.